Happy Palm Sunday to all of you. Uh, my mom and I were talking this week and she was telling me that one of the ladies that she works with uh, was telling her that her three-year-old granddaughter came home and said, we learned about Palm Sunday at school today. It's when the people shout Hosanna in the highest and shake their pom-poms and cheer for Jesus. <laughs> so I, I, I considered getting in my closet and dragging out my old pom-poms from when I used to be a cheerleader and doing that, but I decided, no, we really kind of need to stick with Palm Sunday, not pom-pom Sunday. And, um, but close, you know, close. Palm Sunday is the Sunday that we remember, we are reminded of that day when Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem and the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And understandably, the people had an idea, understandably, had an idea of what this new kingdom was supposed to look like. I mean, they had been under deep oppression. They had been treated miserably by the Romans and the Roman government. And they were excited and they were looking forward to a kingdom that would take place, that would, that would shift the power. And yet Jesus had this different idea of how that's supposed to look. In fact, we hear all throughout scripture how power and glory belong to God, not to us. And on, on this day, we also are talking about, we're in the, in the last Sunday, the final Sunday of a sermon series titled, Praying with Power, the Lord's Prayer. And what we've been doing through this sermon series is looking each week at specific verses in the Lord's Prayer and looking at them more deeply and, and trying to gain some understanding that this isn't just a prayer that we're supposed to recite. It's not just something that we memorize and not pay any attention to the meaning of the prayer, what deep, rich theology it holds for us and, and what it means for how we're supposed to live our lives. It is not just a prayer that we memorize and speak by rote. It's a prayer that we're supposed to, to gauge our lives by and live our lives by. The book that I have been reading throughout the sermon series by David Timms is a book called Living the Lord's Prayer. Because this prayer teaches us not only how to pray, but how to live as well. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses um, 5 through 13. Um, if you do not have your Bibles with you, um, the words can be um, found on the screen. I'll be reading this morning uh, from my grandfather's Bible uh, and from the King James Version. And so I invite you to stand as you are willing and as you are able to hear and to receive into your heart the word of God. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray... Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated and let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for this, your word. We thank you and, you pray, and we praise you that this word is, is spoken when it was spoken and it's being spoken to us today and that we are to pay attention to your words and to live them out. So thank you, God, and speak to our hearts today. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. In one of the books that I'm reading right now, it's a book where pastors actually share um, some uh, stories of overcoming uh, difficult situations in churches and sometimes difficult people in churches. And uh, one of the stories that I read this week, uh, a pastor was sharing that 
Uh, he had really begun to feel like life was just bombarding him. And um, one Sunday morning, he actually stood up in the pulpit and he said to um, the congregation, I'm just not in a good place right now. And I can't preach a sermon to you. And I'm asking for your prayers for me and for my family. And he went and he, and he sat down. And that was the end of that. And I read that. I had to close the book for a moment. I couldn't imagine standing in front of a congregation and saying, I'm not in a place where I can preach to you right now. And in full disclosure, I want to tell you this this morning. This sermon has created tremendous tension for me all week because I had already in my mind what I wanted to say to you, I think before I really spent as much time in prayer about it as I should have. And so I had all these things that we were gonna talk about today, right? We were gonna talk about how this, this part of the prayer was added later and by who it was possibly added and by whom and, by, and why. And, and, I, and I really wanted to talk about how it, it's a doxology part of the prayer, talk about how the Lord's Prayer begins with praise and ends with praise and our lives should be that way. And then I really had in my mind that this is what we were gonna do today. We were gonna really focus on this word, thine, I had things written in the sermon earlier this week where I said things, you know, like, it's not about us, it's about God. And I was certain that that's where it was supposed to go, except there just kept being this tension in me. That's, that's what this sermon's supposed to be about, right? For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. We we're going to focus just on that word, thine. And even when, when we went to bed last night, I, I told Robert, I was like, this sermon isn't right. I mean, I don't think it was a bad one, necessarily. It just wasn't right. And I, I just struggled, and I couldn't go to sleep. And about 4 o'clock this morning, I woke up, and I realized that God was trying all week to get me to listen instead of just write. And that what he really wanted me to look at and to share with you is to answer a different kind of question. And that question is why? Why do we pray? Why do we pray the Lord's Prayer? Why do we pray any prayer? What difference do we believe it makes when we pray and can we honestly can we truly be self-aware enough in our relationship with God and in our conversations with God to, to be completely honest in answering the question why do you pray why do you pray the Lord's prayer why do you pray any prayer for that matter I wonder if so often it isn't so that we can tell God that he needs to change our circumstances. God, you need to improve my circumstances. We pray thinking that maybe we have that kind of power to name it and claim it and tell God how to order things and how to make things happen. And I don't mean this, I'm not talking about an accusatory kind of like selfish, I'm not saying that we pray selfish prayers, that's not what I'm saying. Um, I don't play the lottery, so clearly I've never prayed to win it. I've, but I've also never prayed to be rich or famous. Um, but I have definitely prayed, asking God to change the circumstances in my life. As a mother of four children, one who, who the ma majority of her life struggled with health issues, I've sat beside her hospital bed not knowing if she was going to be okay. And I have prayed, God, please change these circumstances. 
please improve these circumstances. So what I want you to understand is I'm not talking about us being selfish in our prayer. I'm talking, what I'm trying to say is that do we go to God thinking that he's the one who's supposed to change? Or do we go to God with the understanding that prayer changes us? Prayer is meant to change us. It's meant to change our attitude and our thoughts and our disposition. It's supposed to change everything that we see about God. How is prayer changing us? What if, what if prayer is not really to solicit God's attention toward us, but to solicit and to catch our attention toward him, toward God? Why do we pray? I think if we're earnestly praying the Lord's Prayer and with earnestness and, and earnestness and sincerity, we say, for yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory, that that's gonna create some tension for us. Or I think it probably should if we're praying it earnestly, if we mean it when we say it, if we're trusting God with everything that we call our lives, there's going to be some tension. David Timms writes, in a world buried in mediocrity, waist deep in complacency, and swamped often by our own self-centeredness, prayer actually calls us to transformation. Prayer calls us to transformation. How is your prayer life changing you? How is mine? Am, am I... Am I are we spending that time in prayer knowing that we need to surrender and be transformed? Prayer isn't meant to change God. It's meant to change us. The Lord's Prayer expresses a lifestyle. It, 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 it expresses a way of living, not simply a vocabulary or a way of talking. It expresses a way of living. When, when we pray, it's often like this list of all of our hopes and dreams and our wants and our needs. And, and we're asking and, and, and we're asking and we're requesting. And, and so again, these often are not selfish. They're not make me great and powerful kinds of prayers. They're completely understandable. But are they transforming us? Are they transforming you in our spirit and in our attitude toward God? When I walk into a hospital room as a pastor, and I see people gathered around someone's hospital bed praying. Or when I have been beside the bed of a loved one or a family member. Or when I was lying in that bed myself in the hospital. I've prayed those prayers and I believe that God loves me. And I believe that God loves you. I believe God loves all of us so much that he desires to hear our prayers. He desires and wants and longs to hear what's on our hearts. So please don't hear me say that you should leave here today and not ever tell God ever, anything ever again. That's not the point of this. But when you are pouring out your heart, heart toward God, when you're pouring out those things that are on, in your life and on your mind, are you allowing God to transform you in that process? Are you able to say, I, I, I surrender this because this is your kingdom and it's your power and it's your glory and, and I surrender to that and, and I'm transformed by it. I'm transformed by it. For absolute and complete transformation, we must surrender. And it's not a word that we typically like to use. It's not seen as a good thing. Surrendering, that's not what you do. Submitting, that's not what you do. Submission has, has the, the idea of su submission to another person it has, has been misunderstood in the world that we live in. Yesterday afternoon when there was a wedding that I had the honor of officiating, officiating at this wedding. Nick Gwynn, who often does our children's sermon here on Sunday mornings, he and his wife got married. There they are. Happiest groom, I swear, I have ever seen. <laughs> he smiled like this, like all day. And you, you didn't, all day, that didn't stop. Like he ate like that. He danced like that. He said his vows like that. Um, just such a happy person. And for their scripture, they chose Ephesians 5, through 33, that says, wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. A scripture that a lot of people do not want at their weddings because we don't always understand that that's mutual submission. And we don't understand that the example that Christ has set for us is to submit to the will of the Father. 
This week when we go through Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, I mean, we will walk that path that Christ walked before his crucifixion, before his resurrection. We will walk that on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. We'll be reminded that when Jesus wept in the garden, he said, if this cup can pass from me, but not my will, Father, but your will be done. And it transforms us. It transforms our situations. God's power and God's glory at work because that's what we're seeking. God put us on this earth, but we do not own this earth. It all belongs to God. So how do we do that? How does that look? One of my favorite authors is C.S. Lewis. I love to read C.S. Lewis. And one of the personal stories that I've read about C.S. Lewis is the story of his marriage. He married a woman named Joy Gresham. She was uh, an American writer. And he married her in, a, in kind of a, a secret, uh, private. She was a single mom. And, and he married her in a secret kind of private civil ceremony so that she could gain English citizen, citizenship. And not long after they were married, um, Joy was, or they spent years together actually, and, and, and Joy was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so this is when C.S. Lewis began, and, and, his, and his wife Joy began to realize they had this deep love for one another. Well, that cancer, even though they were told it was terminal, it went into remission for a period of time. And C.S. Lewis writes that during that period of time, they just experienced this beautiful love that they shared for one another as they cared for one another during that time. And so C.S. Lewis was having a conversation one day with a friend of his who was an Anglican priest whose name was Harry. And the Anglican priest said to him, you know, I know that you have prayed so hard and so diligently for your wife. And now God is answering your prayers in this remission. And this is how C.S. Lewis responded to that. These are his words. But that's not why I pray. I pray because I cannot help myself. I I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God. It changes me. What a deep and profound understanding of thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Surrender and transformation. A beautiful understanding. And this prayer ends with this word that most prayers end with most of the time. Uh, amen. I read this week. I didn't, had never read this before, but I read this week that if you're singing it, it's pronounced amen. And if you're speaking it, it's pronounced amen. I don't know if that's right, but I read it. So there you go. And some of you might be thinking, really, preacher, I've known that since I was eight months old and you're just now figuring it out. But this simple little four-letter word that's so incredibly complex. In fact, I believe there are words that just can't be effectively translated. And this is one of them. It's a Hebrew word. And it, and it couldn't really be translated into Greek. But the Greek people continued to use the word amen because it had all this richness and all this depth. It had all this history Um, And so they continued to use words like Hosanna and hallelujah and amen, amen, without trying to translate them because they knew it would just fall flat. In the Bible, the word amen has great significance. At the very least, it's a resounding yes to the Father. At the very least, Time and time again, we read these scriptures like in Timothy and Hebrews and and 1 Peter and in Jude where the writers say, the Lord will rescue me from the evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forever. Amen. The amen stands as a definitive exclamation point. I mean, it has carried enormous history and depth and force all throughout time. It, amen, captures the assurance of the soul. That acknowledgement. I grew up in a tradition where amen was said a lot. Amen is, a, is I think, one of the kingdom words. I, I love this word. And I grew up in a tradition. My grandfather was a southern, and by southern, I mean southern Baptist preacher. 
And he would, his congregation would say amen when he would say those things that they knew there was just an assurance in their soul. This is God speaking through the power of his Holy Spirit. And the people would say amen. There was one man, I remember him. I almost thought for a while he was on a timer that just ever so many seconds, you know, he'd be like, amen. I wanted to grow up and do that just every now and then. So people would say amen. And if they didn't, my grandfather would call them out on it, right? Granddaddy would say something that he thought God really placed on his heart. And if nobody said anything, he'd say, can I get an amen? And somebody would amen, especially the amen guy. No one that I ever heard when my grandfather was preaching said, sort of. (laughs) Or really close. No, it's this assurance, this acknowledgement, this agreement. Amen. My grandfather would say, if he, again, if they didn't amen the way he needed them to, he would just say this, these words, ready? And all of God's people said, amen. and they would do it. I would do it. You just did it, right? <laughs> amen. It's got this profound meaning uh, and this depth. Let's put an amen to allowing our lives, our prayers to transform us, our lives to be transformed by our prayers. Stop trying to change God and allow God to change us. When we walk away from our prayer time with God, are we walking away surrendered and transformed? It's a beautiful gift. A beautiful gift. Are we surrendering ourselves and our lives to God? I want to encourage you in these days to come that every time you pray, I mean, maybe go home and watch War Room. This will help too. But to allow yourself to be in that prayer in such a way that you have surrendered to God all of those desires and those wants, all of those needs, and trust God. Put an amen to allowing your life to be transformed by God. That verse, the end of verse 13, it says, for yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. And all of God's people say, amen.